First of all, I mean, let's start with where we, our initial, when we found out that Tanner was transferring to Wisconsin, we're coming off of, I guess, the high, the, the beginning of the initial high, I guess is the easiest way to put it, of these transfers coming in. And, you know, Nick Evers, this highly touted prospect, and now we get a highly touted quarterback with experience. When you found out he was transferring and going to lead this air raid offense, where did your head go? How many records is he going to set? I, I, like, I, you know, it felt like it felt honestly, it felt like the perfect piece because you, you landed the high upside young guy who's probably not quite ready. And then it felt like this coach, it felt like this coaching staff had every answer is what it felt like, right? You landed that guy for the future. And then you landed the perfect kind of bridge piece. And yeah. by the way, a bridge piece that had been prolific at a lower level who could fling the ball around, who was super competitive. Um, it felt like the perfect piece. Like if they, it felt like they hit a grand slam in the off season. And I remember I did a show specifically. It was like, I wonder if he's going to set the Wisconsin passing touchdown record single season, which let's be honest, like it's not a super prolific history of quarterbacks here. So it didn't seem that outlandish. And then you look back and yeah, I mean, that's where I went, right? I went to record books. I went to the perfect piece. I went to this. I was all caught up in it. I think a lot of us were, um, but I was super excited for him. Oh, for sure. I mean, I, from a coaching point of view and looking at his experience in the air raid, his experience in high tempo, fast paced, quote unquote, modern football. It's the perfect starting point for a new system. And I was beyond excited because it was, he's just the antithesis of your typical Wisconsin quarterback. He's a gunslinger with the stats to back it up. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had gunslinger types. We've had guys with big arms, but they didn't have the numbers to back it up. And we could say that, you know, SMU is at a different level, but still you have to be a good quarterback to put up those kind of numbers. And he had everything you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And then we get to the launch and a big part of my, and that was the first breakdown I ever did, was going through and quote unquote justifying all the picks. And a, and a lot of it was not his fault. You know, you could tell early on that there was something missing in the chemistry between him and the receivers that just was not there. And and, and I'm thinking in my head, okay, spring practice. He's been with these guys for a couple months. It's got to get better, right? How are you feeling when you saw the offense, you know, this, the hype that we gave ourselves and I blame myself too, you know, uh, as excited as I was, we did finally see it in practice. You saw, th saw things that we liked, but then typical Wisconsin QB play. Yeah, I, I hesitate to say we overlooked it too much, right? Because it, at the end of the day, it still was just was one practice. And there were yeah. multiple practices, a multitude of practices that other reporters were able to go to that said, no, he looked really great. I mean, the people who saw him every day, they kind of one-offed it and said, that was kind of weird. Now, we probably should have had at least a little bit more of an alarm bell, like maybe not the full-on five-star chill, like the holy crap, but maybe we should have had a little bit more, but... I also don't I also kind of think we were right in not completely overreacting to that because you it's super easy to go to a spring practice game. The weather was terrible. The receipt yeah. like there were some passes where it, it didn't feel like it was on him, whether our receiver just didn't run a route. So I don't know. I kind of feel like we handled that one. OK, like, yeah, we probably should have talked about it a little bit more. But in the end of the day, to me, it just was one practice. Um, there were I think there were some things and we're going to get into the season. I think there were some things coming up in the season that we couldn't foresee. Right. That maybe played a bigger role than, oh, he never had it. Because it, if you again, if you read other people's stuff who saw him, it sounds like he did have it for a lot of that portion. And we just caught him on a, a bad day, albeit an exceptionally bad day. Right. Yeah. And, and for me, it was the beginning of seeing 
that this transition from the pro style to the air raid was going to take some time because it just seemed like nobody outside of the running game seemed comfortable. And he led that. Mm -hmm. He just seemed so, I mean, I can't think of a better word than uncomfortable. And, and I think part, a lot of it comes down to he spent five years before that and probably all the years in high school. You know, I'm sure he played in a similar system in high school, getting used to one temple, getting used to one feel and the progression. And then he gets to Madison. And then to that point, he had really mostly been on air and throwing with guys after practice and now getting in a game situation. And it was just wasn't there. But like you said, everyone said it was an anomaly. Mm -hmm. And then when he went into fall camp, from all accounts, he had a killer fall camp. And he was able to build a consistency. We, we heard early talks about his rapport with Will Pauling. It's like, okay, things are going to calm down. We're going to get into the season. And he never really, early on, I don't think he ever really settled in. Yeah. He looked, he looked again, he would get to the top of his drop and he'd expect somebody to be there and they weren't there or he didn't have the patience to wait. We were also in that, you know, early identity crisis as everyone was saying it with the offense, but early on, you know, some of those whispers that we heard during the, the launch started to, creep louder it didn't help with all the this is the worst team since don morton crap that we heard get louder and louder but on the positive side he might not have seemed comfortable but he showed flashes and he just showed that that leadership and moxie that you get from a guy who's been there and he surprised us in other ways and how he handled mm -hmm. early season woes with the center issue with Braylon being injured mm -hmm. or banged up or whatever. I think the drops just impacted kept going. Him. Yeah. I, I think the drops impacted him a lot. I, yeah. you, you look at historically what he was at SMU and again, different level, but this, this was this last year was by far, uh, the least yards per attempt of his career. Like that, that's not really where he previously had made his hay, right? Those kind of, and it, it felt like you had two or three drops early on the deep passes that were pretty well thrown. Um, it all, it, it felt like that impacted him. Uh, I think the snaps impacted him, but you're right. There's, there's a lot of ways to win as a quarterback, especially at the college level, at the NFL level, it's a little, a little narrower, right? You have to do certain things at the college level. You can win a lot of games as a quarterback with a level of, of moxie, some feet, some leadership and a couple timely plays. Right. And I think he showed that portion of it the entire year, right? Like, I, I, and you speak to teammates, you speak, you hear coaches talk about him. I mean, I've talked to a couple of guys in the program. Like, there, there is no, no questions regarding the intangibles uh, of Tanner Mordecai and how he handles some of that stuff. So, that's probably something we didn't talk about enough during the season. Like, I remember <clears throat> we talked about the injury, and I guess we're still getting into that. But we said, well, why would he come back right now? And I think we all probably underestimated the intangibles he brought to that spot. So he, that's a carrying trait throughout the year. But early on, I think the drops, I think the drops really impacted him because it felt like early on we took more deep shots. He would get to the top yeah. of his drop and rip it a little bit more. And it feels like he got a little gun shy. And you can't blame him essentially when players are dropping passes. Yeah. I, I you, you hesitate to say that the infamous Skylar Bell wide open drop against Buffalo was a season changer, but it was because it changed his, you could see it changed his, the way he gets through his progression and that antsiness that it seemed like he had, it wasn't necessarily antsiness. He was just rushing through his, his progression and receivers were not helping him. Mm -hmm. You know, Skyler dropping the ball, Jim Ray DK couldn't get off of anybody who was within three yards of him and CJ Williams, not getting open. Bryson, Bryson Green, Bryson Green was winning the 50, 50 having drops. And 
so this all muddies the our feel of him because it, you know if his receivers played five percent better all season, how how would we be thinking about him differently? Mm-hmm. Because how much of what he did wrong is on him, and how much of what he does did wrong is on the totality of the the cluster F that was the Wisconsin offense at times last year. Oh yeah, I mean it it, it showed we showed so many flashes, and I've broken things down so many times and watch every play over and over again. So I know the stuff works and I know he works in the system, but just something was off. Well, I would say too, he's not a, he's not a, a top tier quarterback. I mean, that's why he's been in college for six years, right? Those guys, they need pieces around them to work well, to be good. Yeah. Like he needs receivers to catch the ball and he needs a center to snap the ball. And he like he needs those pieces around him to be who he can be. Right. And then and then if he has this piece around him, he can augment all the other pieces. But he's not a guy if he's not getting good receiver play, good offensive line play, good center play. Like he's just not a guy that can elevate all those other pieces around him. It's kind of like when when your car gets I don't want to say total because I don't think the I don't think the Wisconsin offense was totaled last year. But when your car gets in a big accident and you bring it to the mechanic, it's not like it's just the engine that's bad. Like your yeah. engine got messed up, the front axle, the tire. Like there were a lot of components last year that just were off. And then because he's the quarterback, obviously he's the epicenter of that. I don't think he got a completely fair shake, and people are going to interpret that as Ryan's making excuses. I don't think it's an excuse. I think it's just a reason. Um, yeah. And he wasn't good enough either. Like he's a part of that equation but it's an equation with multiple variables. And then, you know, he finally starts to maybe get a little more comfortable, you know, Purdue and Rutgers were starting to see him hang in the pocket a little bit more. You know, he took a lot more deep shots against, uh, especially against uh, Purdue. And then the Iowa game happens. Mm -hmm. And when we need him the most, he gets injured. And at a time in the season, you know, you hear the injury reports and I I don't know what you thought, but I thought, well, he's done. That's the last time we're going to see him in a Wisconsin uniform. That's the last time we're going to see him on a sideline because at still at that time, I thought, okay, for all the leadership intangibles that he has and, you know, the, the good kid that he, he definitely seems like he is, he was coming to Wisconsin for a reason. And that was to improve his draft stock so he can get a better shake in the NFL. Now he's injured. Well, what else is he there for? But he was still there. And you could see him on the sidelines helping Braden. Mm-hmm. He had the headset on. He's talk, He's He's a de facto quarterback's coach because he's the exact type of guy you go to when you don't want to ask the quarterback coach what you did wrong because you'd never want to admit that. And then we found out, you know, we were excited. I remember us, you know, talking on on your show about about Braden and how excited we were because Braden would pull the trigger. He'd sit back there and he would just he he'd sling it. And so we were excited that, okay, the younger guy is going to come out there, going to earn a shot. And maybe we don't need Tanner Mordecai. But we certainly still did. And it became evident once we get into those dark, dark times that were Nebraska, oh, no, excuse me, uh, Northwestern mm. and Indiana, you know, you know Br- Braden showed some great things, but we really saw what we were missing when Tanner was gone and what he brought to the offense. Yeah. Br- Braden also showed, showed some warts, right? Which, I mean, it should be expected, right? That's no knock on him. He's a, he's yeah. a young kid still learning. Yeah, I, I was right there with you um, on the injury. I thought that was it. Like, A, I thought it was it for two reasons. Like, A, why is he going to rush back and try to – I mean, essentially at that point, that season had been derailed, right? This is not a season you're rushing back to get into, you know, an outside chance. At, you're not winning the Big Ten. You know, like there wasn't – the, the season was was not what it should have been. Why is he rushing back? And then I, I thought, frankly, the Wisconsin coaching staff would want to see more of what they have in the younger quarterbacks. Um built for the future but yeah like there's i'll say this about mordecai he's definitely a foxhole guy right and for those who are not in the military he's the type of guy who 
Like he could have just walked away. No, but not many people would have been like, oh, what a bad guy. Like, no, he's he's kind of here in one year rental. He got hurt. And by the way, the team didn't do a ton to support him with weapons around him that were working well. Like he could have just been like, I'm done. This sucks. And to your point, man, that's a great point. Like he stayed super engaged. That's a credit to him. That's a credit to the character that he has. Um, which is why we eventually saw him again. Because if he had put yep. the hands up, even if he had got back healthy, the coaching staff would have been like, nah, we're good. But the fact that he was there, he's a foxhole guy. Um, I'm happy he was able to get back out there. And I'm happy that he was able to finish it off. I know we're going to get there, but finish it off in that way. And this all goes back to the character that he had. But yeah, I, I was right there with you. I thought it was it. I thought that was the end of the the short Tanner Mordecai era. Yeah, and, and you know, it didn't, when he came back, he didn't seem gun shy. He didn't change his game, you know, especially in the Northwestern game. I'm every time he's moving in the pocket, I'm holding my breath. Like don't get hurt again. You know, like we let's not do this again, but he fought through it. Able to finally start turning things around against Nebraska, against Minnesota. And then it, it's leading up to the bowl game. And, a lot of people around us are not thinking about what this game is going to be. You know, it's going to be the best game of the season. It's going to be, oh, we're playing against LSU. I don't care how bad their defense is. They got athletes all over the field. We got a quarterback coming off an injury, and we're missing our starting center, our number one outside receiver, Braylon Allen. Braylon Allen, yep. And we're missing all these pieces. Well, I hope I hope uh, Tanner doesn't get himself hurt again, and then he just comes out there and is the Tanner Mordecai that we all expected. Just sitting back in the pocket, ripping the ball all over the field, throwing from all different arm angles. He was the guy that we expected. It might have taken all the way until. The last game of the season, but we got the guy that we expected. And what a way to go out. And you, and again, you saw it at the end. He was genuinely bummed when they lost because mm -hmm. he left everything on the field. Like, that wasn't the quarterback who was sitting there trying to build his draft stock. That was one more shot with the boys. Because, again, we talked about it on your show as well. He knew that that was probably his last meaningful football game that he will play in his entire career. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll talk about him as, as a, as a pro prospect here in a little bit, but he just went out on his shield and just let it all hang out. And we saw everything that we expected without, without the key pieces, which again, might've been part of the issue, you know, how the offense worked this year, when you subtract a couple pieces, it actually got better. And I don't care. It was against LSU's bad defense. It was the second most athletic defense that they played against all season, you know, outside of Iowa, or maybe third best, I guess, outside of Iowa and, and Ohio state scheme wise, but he just let it rip. Yeah. That's a hell of a way to go out. Right. By the way, if, if that's the version you get all year, he's throwing for 3,700 yards and 30 touchdowns. Oh, which, easily. which is basically we're like, hey, this guy could throw for 3,700 yards and 30-something 30, 30 touchdowns. Um, so, like, that's the version we wanted. I, I smirked a little bit when you said, and without our starting center. And I was kind of like, ah, we got our starting center back that game. Right? That's like, true. You're totally right. And, they, and, again, there's no no pettiness directed towards Bordellini, but he's not a center. No, he's no. a guard. No, 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 and, no. And he's a really good guard. Like he's a good blocker. Yep. He's a good guard. And he stepped into a tough spot and he gutted it out. By the way, that's not, I know this isn't a Bordellini show. Kudos to him because you know he's taking pot shots on social media the entire season when he's not playing the spot he's supposed to be playing. Oh, okay. yeah. And, and I uh, count me in on that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I it. was critical of him all season. I got critical even after his family members started following me on social media and made me feel a little bit nervous about criticizing. And he he's shown. Of course, I never knew he was that good of an athlete. Four nine forty. Let's go. I mean, I, I knew he was. Good. I knew he was a he was a serviceable guard. And now all of a sudden, anyways, that is another show. We yeah. could have a Tanner Bordellini show, which I would be all for. But yeah, so I, that is pushing my numbers. 
<laughs> I, I really think, man, like, hey, I thought it was funny, too, the narrative leading up to the bowl game. Obviously, a lot of players, players on both sides opted out, right? LSU's without guys, Wisconsin's without guys. There, there was a funny narrative. Someone said, and, and Tanner Morton, guys, not not opting out, like, good for him. And I was like, well, where, where's he going to opt out to? I mean, I'm not trying to be petty, but, like, of course he's yeah. playing. Like, why? So I thought that was kind of a silly narrative. But he played incredible. He was ripping the ball. I think we talked about it all year, but – but there, there's there's too much you can just see with your eyes when the snap gets to him quickly and he can catch it and just get to that back foot and rip it, right? Where he's not having to corral the ball in different spots and he loses his eyes because he's looking to where the snap is going to go. I think that was a huge part of it. And it's so unfortunate that I think he had to kind of deal with that the entire year. Um, and I think it threw everything off. Uh, so, yeah, does it does it matter? Because it's a bowl game that nobody cares about anymore, and LSU wasn't very good. I I think it matters to Tanner Mordecai. I yeah. as a fan, I enjoyed watching it. Like so, yeah. It there's people who say it doesn't matter because of this, that, or this. I'm a Badger fan. Like it mattered to me, and I was happy to see him go out there and rip it. So great performance, hell of a way to end it. I wish we could have beat them, um, but I think this. Yeah. <laughs> I think Renfro made an enormous difference, man, and it's a shame yeah. we didn't see that version all all year. This, unlike any other, this season was the season of what if. There are so many little things that could have gone one way or the other. And I mean, this this is more than the 2011 season where we're two plays away from playing for the national championship. And, you know, a couple things here and here and there, how different this season would have been. Mm -hmm. And we would be thinking differently about Tanner and him leave and now him leaving. And that's the hard part about these, uh, you know, one year rental types is they grow on you. You know, it's, it's like, it's like any prospect. We, 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 we see them come in, we're excited. We see them make plays and the difference is maybe met Toya. We're going to see him for the next three or four years at least. Hopefully. Like well, again, you never know nowadays. Well, that's true. But but now, you know, we we finally see the tanner that we expected to see. And and we he's been entertaining to watch all season. I haven't had a, I can't remember a badger quarterback who's been entertaining to watch since Russell Wilson. And I even I don't even know if Russell Wilson was entertaining. He was just good. Tanner okay. was just he he could he's just you know, you never knew what was gonna happen. You know, you knew all you knew is he was going to escape that pressure somehow, and he was going to get rid of the ball, or he was going to take off. You know, he had these had all these things, and but now he's gone, and I think I'll go switch up my 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 uh, my outline here. What is his legacy at Wisconsin? To me, he's going to be a guy that's going to be remembered. As I mean, he's he's always going to be synonymous with the start of the Luke Fickle era and the Phil Longo era. But for me, in, in an era where I mean, I've been a Badger fan for over thirty years, and you know, quarterbacks that we can remember for positive play, I can count on one hand, and maybe three fingers. You know, it's what is his legacy? What, what, where will he be remembered in Wisconsin football history? Or will he just be another one of these guys who flashed and ultimately is going to be, I mean, a harsh word to say is forgotten, but be lost to the annals of history? He's so. And I don't think this is really necessarily on him, but for a lot of reasons, I think he's just a footnote. I like if 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 the book of Badger quarterbacks was in the library, right? You'd have a, I think you'd have a chapter for Scott Tolsey. You'd have a chapter for Stave. You'd have a chapter chapter even for Houston for some of the the Big Ten championship that he started. Like one of the you know, like you'd have a chapter for a lot of guys. I think Mordecai's a footnote. I don't think he gets a chapter in the, in that book because uh, for a lot of reasons, a he didn't play that well. I mean, we, we talk a lot about yep. Moxie and, and entertainment value. And he, he did have all, he finished with nine touchdown passes, right? Like at the end of the day, he, he, he didn't play very well on a team that disappointed and he was here for a year. So I, 
it will not remember the Mordecai era fondly. That that is again really not as much a knock on him as the whole thing just felt broken. Uh, he got hurt for a bit. I, I mean, that's where I'm at. Like, I'm certainly open to being wrong, and that's just my take on it. And it's nothing against him. I don't. I think he kind of did the best with what he had, which again didn't give him a lot of help at times. But yeah, that's where I'm at. I, I think he's kind of a footnote guy. He is a. I'm trying to think of a Badger comp. Like to me, he's like a Chase Wolf type. I mean, he's he's better than Chase Wolf. No, make no. But like, mm-hmm. I'm gonna remember him. I'm gonna spend as much time remembering Chase Wolf as I do probably Tanner Mordecai. Yeah, for me, he's he's definitely in that Bart Houston, Kirk Phillips kind of expectations didn't meet on the field production. The other two, they had injury, you know, injury issues and then playing behind people. And you saw flashes and you sh- saw little things like, God, I wish he would have played earlier. And, or I guess put it the incomplete story, the incomplete chapter, the incomplete quarterbacks where the sample size of what they brought was too small. And you wish you got to see more or you, you wish they had a more of a shot. I know I can, I can list tons of, you know, from oh, yeah. DJ Gillens and the Austin Kefenses and, and all these other guys that, you know, were brought something different compared to your stereotypical Wisconsin game managing quarterback. And even our best quarterbacks were well, outside of Russell Wilson were, were game manager types. Yep. You know, he wasn't a game manager. He was a game breaker for good or for worse. He, you know, and he definitely showed both sides of it. So to me, I'm I'm gonna remember him obviously because he was the first Derry Raid QB. And you know, I hope I hope he latches on somewheres and can extend his career for a little while. I think he's gonna make a hell of a coach. Because you can tell he's smart and he understands this system, but yeah, it's it's definitely not the conversation we're having now is not the one I expected we were going to having at this time last year. See? At this time last year, we're 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 planning the we're planning the the, the statue. Is yeah. it going to go to the right of Barry? Is it going to go to the left? Or maybe and, just knock Barry's over and put Tanner's right there yeah, on top of it. Yeah. Oh man. So Building. so that brings so that brings us to. The whole reason that he came to Wisconsin was to up his NFL draft stock. Uh, Well, I think we know now he he's not getting drafted, obviously. Mm -hmm. But does he have a place on an NFL roster? Does he have or does he have a place at least? Is he going to be getting paid to play football in the next? two to three years, whether it be a practice squad or UFL. What do we think? I mean, listen, there's certainly a chance. Well, I'll start with, I hope he does, right? Like I cheer for everybody to have success, right? So I'll start there. I hope he does. And there's always, who knows what the other leagues, like the USFL like type leagues, they're always popping up and then dying. But maybe in a situation like that, he could. Um, I don't think there's a chance in the NFL. I, I, I don't think I just this is bad film from this year for a lot of reasons, not all of which is on him, but some of which is. I don't think he's he's not doesn't have the size that NFL teams are traditionally looking for. Listen, let's be honest. Like the reason he came to Wisconsin is his bold body of work. Scouts had seen a lot of Tanner Mordecai. Let's be super clear. And scouts, NFL teams aren't shy mm-hmm. of drafting team players from non-power five, division two. They're not shy about it at all. So they'd already seen the body work and said, mm, we're good, which is why I came to Wisconsin. And then the stock went down. Yeah. So I, I don't see a scenario like, could he get like a, a camp invite? Absolutely. Because a lot of teams will get 90 people into camp. Right. Yeah. So absolutely. Will he latch on those roster spots, man, as you know, are really hard to come by. And I'm hesitant to say he has much of a chance there, but rooting for him a hundred percent. I think he'll get, he's going to get I, at least a chance at a rookie mini camp. You know, there's a couple intriguing options out there that fall within the coaching trees of what he's used to. Washington with Kingsbury, you know, 
he could be a camp arm. He could be a rookie mini camp arm. I, I think he can latch on to a train to a training camp. Is he going to make a, a 53? No chance. Is he going to make an expanded practice squad? Maybe. But I mean, Joel Stave hung around in the NFL for a couple of years. Jim Sorgi hung around the NFL for six years. Those are different quarterbacks, different styles, and they did what they could. He has the, you know, the Madden, Madden ratings at certain spots enough to get on a, raw, a roster, but he just couldn't put it all together. And that's a shame because when he was on, he was on. And he was so fun to watch. And he made, he made all the throws, but he had, didn't do it consistently. He was going to be coming to the NFL with having to relearn footwork. Um, that's completely different. So unless he latches on to, again, to an air raid style offense, which I guess would only be Washington, he might have problems. Do you think this, and we'll wrap it up here. Do you think his play this year is going to ser serve as a warning to any of these young quarterbacks that we get coming in through the system? Or is it, oh, it's a one-year thing. You know, the kids are smart enough to see that this was a, I don't want to say a fluke, but they could see that the problem is more than just him and that, you know, it is a process. Because I know you've talked to, you know, some of these kids and, you know, their coaches and is, is he is he a warning sign of things to come or is he just a blip and we're moving in the right direction? I think it's too early to say for sure. Um, I, I would say this. I, I think it's if I had to say one because that's how, that's kind of a cop out answer. I would say it's more of a one off. I I think a lot of things in year one, uh, our expectations were too high, uh, but I think their expectations were too high as well. Like uh, you know, you talk to some of the social media people, you're like, yeah, we're probably going to tone it down a little bit more this year. That's something I got from somebody. You know, I think yeah. I think all together the hype was a little too much and I don't think the pieces were the right fits. There's been already coaching turnover. I feel like for a lot of reasons, a lot of what happened last year from the quarterback play to the offensive line play to some of the receiver play to honestly, some of the defensive play. I think a lot of that you can kind of put in a box and say that that was your one. And I'm not going to pull too much out of that good or bad. Now, why I say we have to wait and see, like, what if Van Dyke struggles this year? And then we start to have a track record of Alongo's pick two transfer quarterbacks that haven't been able to come in and play. Right. So yeah. his play this year, to me, is really important to that you get something better. Otherwise, you do start to build a trend there. But as of now, I'm going to kind of put that in the box, it, like the awkward box of Ryan's memories, my, my middle school pictures and Tanner Mordecai, and it's all going to go in a box. I'm not going to look at it again. So that's kind of where I'm at on that. Yeah. I'm going to miss them. I, I'm going to miss the what if, but I'm excited about the future because, again, as, as bad as things were, the two kids we've got coming in in the next, in this class and the next class are light years ahead of any quarterback that we've had in the past mm -hmm. to begin with. And we can say that in spite of the poor play that we got this year from the quarterback position, we still got our guys or at least one of them. Truth. Second one, second one needs to sign on the dotted line, but I'm pretty sure as long as his brother's there, he's going to be there. But yeah, it's, it's been an interesting year and now on to year two of this experiment and can spring ball come early enough? Can we just get some, right. can we just get a couple of those shots of the ball in the air and hitting somebody in the hands so we can start getting excited again and, and then cause the same amount of hype that we had last year, even though we know we, sh we can't, we're still going to do it because it's better than nothing. It's better yes, to be excited this. about, it's better to be excited about Wisconsin football than not. Can I say this on that front? Like people, and I, again, I, I say this all the time on my show, and I, I mean it. I don't care how anybody fans, like fan however you want, like, and it's all good. I mean that 100%. If you want to be more realist, pessimist, optimist, I don't care. At the end of the day, I'm a fan, and I'm not going to apologize for getting excited. 
Like that's, that's how I do it. And people are like, Oh, don't get excited because of what you saw last year, man. That first, that first Van Dyke 60 yard post pattern that he hits somebody in stride, bro. I'm going to be projecting 37 touchdowns probably. So I am ready to be hurt again, <laughs> but I'm also ready to be excited. And I really think, I really think you're going to be, see a step this year. Um, it's a harder schedule, but I think you're going to see a step. Year two is always better than year one. Mm. Always. And and I think the pieces have gotten better without having to to reinvent the wheel. Like and again, we saw it in the bowl game. We saw these guys that we've been talking about, you know, in hushed tones all season. Oh, Vinny Anthony and Quincy Burroughs and all these guys. And like Tretch. Oh, they actually can they actually can play Tretch. I mean, the man, the myth, the legend, Tretch. And they can play. And I'm more excited about the guys we have coming back than, than anything. So it's going to be an interesting off season for sure. And it, is it springtime yet? It's, it's, I don't know how long I can wait because we need to get back into the. All right. Okay. Thanks to Ryan from Locked On Badgers for jumping on with me and talking about Tanner Mordecai a little bit. Now we're going to get into huddle and we're going to take a look at some clips of Tanner and kind of break him down again uh, for the last time and a little bit sad to say that all right so what I've got here I have put together some clips from his first game at Wisconsin and then his last game at Wisconsin and I think you're going to see a tale of two different quarterbacks uh, I think you're going to see a quarterback the beginning who was I don't want to say nervous but was too much in his own head, was too just trying too hard. And then you're also going to see at the end a quarterback who knew that this is probably going to be his last game of competitive football that he's ever going to play, at least meaningful plays in. And he just let it all hang out and just let it, let it rip. And, you know, it gives you a lot of that what if kind of mentality, like what would have happened if he would have been that way the entire season and was just playing to have fun instead of playing to maybe improve his draft stock. So anyways, that's where we're at. So let's get started. I think I got about 50 clips in this playlist, a lot of, uh, a little bit of everything. All right. So starting off here, easy access throw. And what we saw at the beginning of the season, these access throws, I thought he was really rushing these. And he was really trying to just get it out there too quick. Didn't get his feet quite set how he would want. And I'm just going to change this real quick so I don't have to keep hitting it back and forth. I'm going to open here, plant that back foot. We do want to step into it a little bit. And we didn't really get much of a step early on. All right. Next hip here, play action. And, and this is the beginning of him just not being comfortable in the pocket. And, you know, we look at where his eyes are going. He's progressing across the top of the screen here. Okay, one, two, and he just, he doesn't have it in him right now to just let it rip. And, you know, this is a shot that in the launch or at the launch, he threw a couple picks and, you know, there's a ball there over the middle of the field he just doesn't see it or doesn't want to pull the trigger. So I'll, I'll give it to him that at least he's got his eyes downfield, but he he's gun shy here at the beginning of the season. Drop back. Again, now he's facing pressure. Now this, another reason why he was probably uncomfortable throughout the early part of the season. His pass protection was iffy at best. You know, he's not getting help here from Braylon. And, you know, this is also at the height, uh, the beginning of the snap issues. And, you know, I can see why maybe he was a little bit gun shy. Right, so, again, short arming the access throw. Let's see, even an access throw. This is a stick. And he needs to step into these throws. You know, he's a little bit too wide in his base. And... You know, it's the right throw, the right read. You want to get out there quickly, but he needs to get it up. 
All right, moving on. Again, play action, top of his drop. Sees it, sets his feet, lets it rip. You now this is this is an out to the top of the screen. That's a long throw. That's an NFL throw. Comfortable, nice set, nice quick stride. Gets the ball out on target with some good oomph behind it. And signs of things that to come or could have came. All right. Again, comfortable sitting in the pocket. This is one of those throws that set the tone for the season early where he didn't pull the trigger on these balls after this point for a long time. It's a perfect play, set up perfectly. Skyler, one of his, the first of many drops this season. But I think this took the fastball out of Tanner's arsenal because he just lost faith even early on in the deep ball. Okay, so now here's a situation where this is going to, uh, we've talked about this play ad nauseum at this point, but this is just where he does not feel comfortable in this progression. And it doesn't help. You know, you're new to get a tight end who doesn't know how to run in traffic and hesitates at the wrong moment. Now, this is, Six year senior versus a true freshman. You know, stuff like this is going to happen. But again, this is what starts to cause his hesitation as he goes through the season. Because this is a tight window, even if Ashcraft runs. And now Tanner is going to be thinking, well, is he going to run? Not a lot of great effort on that play by a lot of people. All right, moving on. Quick play action, quick movement, and again, when he's comfortable, just finding the soft spot on a little pivot route, great spacing. His feet are nice and comfortable, nice quick stride, he gets it in there. Again, he knows how to run this offense. He knows how to be successful. He knows how to find the space, but it's all about comfort, and now he's in his wheelhouse again. Nice spacing concept. And again, that's the that's the tight window that he at times this season wouldn't pull the trigger on. And again, nice quick ball. Find the soft spot. You know, this little mesh con this little under concept. Doesn't have to think too much. It's just watching that linebacker. As soon as he widens, he knows he's gonna be able to sit right in between. Okay, and this is okay. So here, the difference here between not being patient or getting happy feet and going through the progression is here, right? Is right here. So they're faking the stock, and he's just looking top one, two, three, not there. Don't like the space and get it out. Okay, he doesn't seem antsy in his feet. He doesn't seem panicked. He's just going through his progressions. Not there. All right, let's get it out. Okay, again. The check down route to the running back here is your avoid inter or avoid interception, avoid incomplete pass play. So that is a sign of progression, of going through the route concept. And that was a good job right there. All right, moving on. Again, play action. Now oh, this is play action. Oh, this is excuse me, this is RPO. So he's reading, he's reading the overhang. When he crashes, he knows he can rip it out here. That's a risky throw. But it's the right call because this edge guy's screaming off the edge. Like edge guys too. How many times can I say edge in one, one sentence? Anyways, so decision-making guy right in his face. Okay, maybe get that ball down a little bit. So next up here, a third and three situation. And again, this, this one is another sign of, one, this is one of the first plays that we really saw his sneaky athleticism. Again, he wasn't a runner at SMU and at, at Oklahoma. He was always been an athletic. I mean, he's a four-star coming out of high school. But we never saw his numbers 
And this this is one of those plays that kind of opens it up. But it 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 happened because again, watch our receivers just have no concept of finding space. You know, CJ can't get off the press. Ashcraft is turning as soon as he's getting popped. He's getting redirected by two people. You know, Bell isn't exactly running his route at full speed. So there isn't much for him to work with on this play. He's keeping his eyes downfield, keeping his eyes downfield. And now he lets his athleticism take over. Okay, here's another one. Again, he likes that little pivot route. Okay, just a little stick concept. Find the space, sit down at the hash. And quick peek outside. Step up in the pocket right there. Again, it's all about comfort. And now he's starting to get a little more comfortable. Progression. One, two, not there. Check down. One, two, not there, check down. Again, we need to find better spacing up top. But one, two, not there, check down. He's good at this. He knows the offense. All right, here's my favorite play of the season, or at least of this game, but one of my favorite plays all season is this dagger concept. One, I love the play design. And this is him standing up tall in the pocket, Letting the routes progress. He's progressing from the seam to the dig. Rip it over the middle field. Chimray takes care of the rest. Again, this is a big throw. Got some oomph behind it. Put it right on the ear hole, right where you want your receiver to catch the ball. And this is this at the beginning of the season was one of those throws that like, okay, we can do this. That's the type of throw that we want to see. That's a, a, a throw like that, simply, we don't see from Badger quarterbacks. I mean, we really don't. Standing tall and zipping the ball on a dig route. You know, Alex Hornibrook ever make a throw like this? Joel Stave? You know, guys who had big arms? There's a difference between having a big arm and having some zip. And that's what we saw right there. Okay, third quarter time now. We're continuing. Play action. Again, I need to stop saying again so much. Let's go back. Play action. Again, we'll look. I really need to stop. Try this one more time. Play action. Looking to the top of the screen. Reading one, two. Not there. It looks like he's uncomfortable. This isn't a comfort factor. This is a just route progression. One, two, not there. Now we're coming off looking for an outlet. We have problems early on throughout the season of these receivers just getting open. Understanding, and we'll talk about this for a little bit before we get going. Our receivers really had a problem understanding the concept of finding space in comparison to running the exact route like the playbook taught us. Air, the air raid is a lot more about understanding space, and the pro style is more you go right here. So th this is another example of he's comfortable. He's going through his progression, and he sees it stands tall in the pocket. That is a hell of a throw. So later, when we see him being antsy, we see him fleeing the pocket early. We got to think, what are the receivers doing downfield that are causing it? Because when the progression is clear and everyone's where they're supposed to be, he knows exactly where to put the ball. He's thrown that ball a million times. Okay. Here's the, now this, this is all on him. He has got, he's locked in right here on our crosser. It opened exactly how he wanted to. It's right there. He didn't pre-snap pay attention where Dulock was. Okay, double mug look. When one drops, you're going to expect the other to drop. They're not just going to drop one. And that's exactly what we get. And he just 
doesn't see it. A little hesitation there, or a little bit of pocket movement. That doesn't keep this from opening up. This is just linebacker sitting there reading it because he's just staring at it the entire time. Now, absolutely the right receiver to look at. Thousand percent. It's wide open. But he's got to hit it. He's got to hit right there. Right there. And that hesitation that we get right there. Got to throw it right there. This pressure obviously plays a factor. Sending two at our running back. Doesn't help. But, you know, maybe get a little too comfortable. Play we've done a million times. Yeah, the linebacker's seen it too. So going through the progression here on the vertical ball. A one, two, three, four. Break it down at the landmark. It's a long way to come downhill on a landmark. But again, there's that word. He knows where the ball is supposed to be. I think maybe our receiver here at the top of the screen let this get a little bit too deep before he determined he was capped. And he probably could have come downhill earlier on this. But that is a great throw. To, and because when we throw a comeback like this, you want to throw it low and away in a position that either we catch it or it skips out of bounds. Because if you hang this ball, it's got a potential for pick six, even on such a deeper route. But this is better pocket awareness, better pocket movement, eyes downfield going through the progression, throws that he knows he can make and that he's comfortable with. Now it's about the receivers getting comfortable with him and where he wants to put the football. All right, so there we go. There was Buffalo, Tanner Mordecai's first game. We saw a combination of him making headsy plays with his arm, with his feet. We saw plays where it really looked like he was thinking too much. He was getting too deep into his own head, too deep in thinking ahead in the, in the progression and a couple straight-up bonehead plays. To me, early on, he really looked like a quarterback who was trying to prove the draft consultants wrong who suggested he came back for another year. Now here at the end of the season, we're looking at a quarterback who knows this is the last film that he is going to put out for NFL scouts. This is the one that he is going to want to talk about because it really brings it all together and maybe shows that the, the bulk of the season this year was a fluke and that he, when he's comfortable, he's on. He played how he played. So it wasn't a fluke. It happened exactly how it was going to happen. But in this game, you are going to see a quarterback who just doesn't care. And he's just going to let it rip. Also had an offensive coordinator who was willing to let it rip. And addition by subtraction with the offense. Losing some key players who were there throughout the bulk of the season and having our best offensive output of the season. Not a coincidence. But that's, that's a topic for another time. All right, so here we go. We are at the Rally Quest Bowl against LSU. And progression. So we're reading top of the screen. Boom. One, two. We're capped. One, two, capped. Yacomelli is just a holder route. One, two. So now we're looking three. One, two, three to the outlet. And the outlet is a little pivot hitch here at the bottom of the screen. Probably could have thrown right there, but I think right when he wanted to throw it is when Bryson decided to break out. So that's why we leave the pocket. And see, because we have man coverage, so we know at least we can get around the edge. 
Okay, so again, missing key guys. Best offensive performance of the season. And I, I will say this because I know people are going to say it in the comments now that I've mentioned that. Most athletic and talented defense that they've played against all season with maybe the exception of LSU, or excuse me, of Ohio State. I don't care what their record says or their stats. They played good against a good team. All right. So three by one here in a third and five situation. Checking it up on the line. Okay, we're going to get a vert shot. Capped. Nope, sorry. Not capped here. We're just going to run the out. We're going to clear out and we're going to out. So top of the screen, number two there. Rip it. Clear it out. Throw it in. Okay, play action. Standing tall. Going through the progression again. Gonna take our vertical shots, find the spot, and sit down right there. And his feet just felt so much more coming up. Then they were not blitzing heavy early. They wanted to play coverage. Now we're bringing pressure. Now he's standing tall in the pocket. This is a throw early in the season, heck, even in December. So he knows pressure's coming. So we, we check out of the empty set to bring in the extra blocker. We're still going to be outmanned. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, this edge guy is close enough. He's got his eyes inside that he could come as well. So he knows he's somebody's going to get a free shot. And he knows that it's going to be one of these three down here that he just needs to wait for. Depending on what coverage we get. So we got the free shot coming in. It's coming late. But just comfortable. This is all arm strength. Because he doesn't step into the throw. This is what, you know, he got caught with this a couple times early in the season where he stepped in and got hit in the leg. Here, just standing tall. And this is all arm. Now it's a little bit of a looping throw. That's a long throw. That is a 35-yard throw falling backwards as we're getting hit. Over two defenders. One of the best throws he's, he's thrown all year. And with some of the throws that he made during the season, I mean, he's got some of the best throws in Wisconsin history. This could also be one of them. Love it. Okay, RPO. And this was another one that we just, he didn't pull the trigger on. Now, again, a lot of teams that we played against this season, you know, LSU was playing zone. They are playing a, they're probably, looks like they're playing quarter, 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 quarter here. Here's our hooked curl flat defender. Probably playing quarter, quarter, and they're probably playing a half coverage here. Middle linebacker sitting over in the middle of the ball. As soon as we see eyes inside, we pull it out. We didn't see this a lot this year because everyone just played man to man against us. So we get finally get a team, and it be, it's because we're spreading things out a little bit more and taking more shots early that LSU is going to play zone. And maybe it it's also the fact that. Right now, Tanner is just grip it and rip it. It's a great throw. And we didn't hit a lot of these this year. I wish we hit more. Pauling is perfectly designed to be the slot guy in the RPO offense. He knows how to find space. And he's got the gas to, to get going after the catch. Again, great throw. Play action. Set up, drop it in. Nothing we could do here. Play action, stand tall, step into it. Nice spot. 
little bit of hand fighting out there, 50-50 ball. Ball's in a good spot, so I'm not worried about an interception or anything at this point. It's just winning the one-on-one -on -one matchup with the corner. And the corner wins this one. Maybe a little bit of pass interference. Okay, so it looks like we've got here, we've got the draw release. So bubble top of the screen. So they got bubble top of the screen. We got fade five out bottom of the screen. Excuse me. Bubble top of the screen, fade five out bottom of the screen. And we're just reading 30. As soon as he widens with the running back, we take off. He was really good at this. Good decision making. And it is little things like this that I actually think is going to get him on an NFL roster for training camp at least, maybe even get a practice squad, is his understanding of this new school football, where it's extre he's extremely comfortable with these package plays. He's extremely comfortable playing fast. And football is changing, and not every quarterback and not every offensive coordinator is, is quite there yet. We're still catching up. He knows what he's doing. Play action, nice drop, standing tall. This play right here, play of the game, because Fertney frickin' holds. Can you imagine being up 21 to nothing on LSU with 11 minutes left in the second quarter? LSU is done if we complete this over. Play action, drop, step in on the target, on money shot right there. Perfect throw. Ugh. Goddamn Michael Fertney. Moving on. Instead, we got third and 13. Pressure, keeping the eyes downfield. Again, situation, he has to throw downfield. You know, there really isn't much of a, ch a check down option. We also get beat inside. Jake Renfro's first football game in two years. But he's really, he's really trying to stick around in the pocket. He, he doesn't want to take off. He's waiting. He wants things to open up here. This is him being more patient. I think early in the season, he takes off right there. And he's going to probably be about three yards short. But he's trying to get the ball downfield. Because to be honest, so another little thing too, I'd rather punt from the 43-yard line than midfield. But that's, again, a whole other topic for another day. All right, next shot here, first and 10. 31-yard line, three-by-one set. Drop back, standing, progression. Let's look at the routes, and again, I'm saying that damn word again. Let's look at how we're progressing. So vert, vert, capping, getting capped, comes back to the check down. Again, it's first and 10. We don't need to force the ball down the field, go through the progression, get the ball out in space, let Tretch do what he does. Reason why I haven't said anything, nothing you can do about this. Again, beautiful throw. Finally get take the shot to CJ that we've been waiting for. Progression is there. He likes the one. This is a one-on-one -on -one matchup. Peaks comes back. Drops it in the bucket. Fantastic throw. Nothing you could do about that. And again, story of the season. You know, he made a lot of great decisions. Threw some good balls. We just had a lot of stupid drops. A lot of errors in pass protection. So a big part of, of his kind of mixed legacy that he's going to have on this just one season 
is what if the people around him played 5% better? Would 5% better on the on the offense translated to much more from the quarterback? You never know. All right, moving on. So this ball ends up obviously being incomplete. This is one of the situations, again, where you don't know what kind of arm strength it takes to get the ball out in a situation like this and get it over the line of scrimmage, and if anything, getting it close to his receiver. Because he doesn't care. He just He's trying to make a play instead of trying not to make a mistake, which was the difference in early in the season. And, you know, maybe we are one error in pass protection here You know, there's a reason why certain guys didn't get a lot of playing time in the running back position. I think we're seeing it here. But he's just going through his progression. One, two, three, not there, looking for the outlet. And got pressure. Still almost completed the pass. Third and 10 situation. Tretch coming across. We're going to run our wheel. And these are the plays I'm going to miss. Because we're going to have athletic quarterbacks going forward. I mean, we could see with Mabry, obviously with Nick Evers. And, but it is this. You, the idea of no matter what happens, he, we never assume he's going to be down until the final whistle. These are the type of plays that I'm going to miss. And why he's got this semi-legendary status is just those little things like this. From a quarterback, when you again, when you looked at his stats, when you looked at his film from this previous season, he didn't really show this. This escapability, this movement. And I'm gonna miss it. <laughs> Cause I don't know if we're gonna see it again. This is a this is a gunslinger who can move in comparison to a mobile quarterback. All right, moving on. Progression. Reading the cap. One, two, three, four. Capped at the top, break it downhill. Now his receivers are finally starting to get where he's expecting them to be. And you can see it in his footwork, just how way calmer he is. And he's even taken the correct longo footwork by this point, which is another thing. But progressing, cross, landmark, come back to it. Progression. Okay, we're reading the burst concept, top of the screen, not there. Get out of the pocket, find our outlet. Vinny Anthony's going to be a good one. Empty. So are we going to get our... No, we're going to take a shot. Again, I'm going to miss this. So they bring the late pressure, gets the shot. But he is just so damn slippery. He's athletic. He's mobile. But he's slippery. That's the best way to put it. So let's go through the route progression. So it looks like we're running double unders at the top of the screen. With Tretch. We're running the deeper of the two routes. Kind of crossing more in the middle of the field. And look how... Uh, this, this video isn't about Tretch, but... Look where he is there. And by the time we get this throw off, that's a long way for him to come. He gets there. And he, he has very good understanding where to be. 
Progression, standing tall in the pocket, rips. And they did not bring, they, they're dropping seven. They're playing true zone all the way across. So this is where a veteran quarterback shines because he knows where the holes are and he knows how to manipulate with his eyes because he's looking outside, boom. Keeping the eyes down. He knows where his guy is going to be. He doesn't even have to look at him. He's looking at the back pylon right there, right down the middle, because he knows that Pauling is going to be sitting right over the top of the ball. Comfortable with his feet. Progression. Setting up. A little subtle. Boom. Right there. Helps widen that linebacker out here. Just a skosh right there. Isn't able to turn back around, and we throw it back behind. Great throw. So here we're, here's another example of a play that earlier in the season we just weren't comfortable with. Because he'd be sitting here antsy, 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 antsy because he wasn't confident that his receiver was going to sit down in the right spot. But Tretch is a natural slot receiver, and he's just natural at finding the spacing. And they kept his, his route tree pretty, pretty limited for this game to help him. So I, I can't wait to see when his role is expanded this, this coming season. But he knows he's going to widen to the numbers, and, or sorry, excuse me, widen to the sticks, and he's just going to sit down. Great throw. Second and one, three by one, or two by two motion, three by one. Going to cause a coverage rotation. Gives us what we want. Out here, here we got to get a little more zip on the ball. And I don't know if this maybe gets tipped on the way through. I don't think it does. Or maybe. But we need to get this just, this has got to be more on a frozen rope. Hangs it just a little bit too much. Again, he could, he puts that ball in a, in a tighter window when he has pressure. When he has time, oh, maybe overthought it a little bit. All right, third and one. First concept. Here's another situation where, again, he might be a little bit too amped up. Because it's there. Boom. He likes it. I don't have to throw it so hard. A little bit behind, too. Getting a little excited. Again, the, the gunslinger is amped up. And, yeah, we get to the second half. All right. So I think we're going to watch this one more drive, and then we're going to call it because I don't want this to be going too long. And we'll kind of have our final thoughts on Tanner after this. So spot, pivot, that's it, throw quick. So here we got, this is an access throw, access throw to the slot receiver. We didn't see a lot of these this year. Usually access to the top of the screen to the wide out. They're running it too, it's all sticks. A nice spot. Wish we saw more of these. I wish we saw them spread the ball around a little bit more on these access throws than we got throughout most of the season. Taking a shot, space, I think he rushed this one a little bit. Likes the matchup, likes, it, likes with the alignment of the safety. He's a little low. His first steps are downhill. We liked, I mean, it's not bad. He's just gotta get it out in front of him a little bit more. Bryson's gotta help him a little bit, fighting his hands off of this, uh, this corner here. I'd like to see him work for a little bit more spacing before he takes off vertical, but I think maybe this is rushed a little bit. There's no pressure. I mean, they're bringing five. Or they're showing five. They're bringing six. We got it. Again, early, se early season hits. Maybe causing him to be a little trigger happy, even late in the season. Third and four. Condensed three by one. And 
and savvy quarterback play here. Understanding the spacing. Let's check the route progression. So burst to the out, to the over. Just going to sit over the numbers. And this is just having your eyes downfield at all times because this is Bryson Green, who's down here. So he goes through his progression, the top of the screen. It's not there. One, two, three, not there. So I'm taking off. And now he just, out of the corner of his eye, sees Bryson. Because he's running this route the whole time through. He's more of a clearing route to hold this underneath so we can sit the ball over the top. Right, there, right down here, but because it breaks the pocket, he looks at that spot. He's probably looking for Tucker initially. And then he sees, yeah, he sees Bryson out of the corner of the eye and makes a fantastic throw. Progression, doesn't like what he sees. Get a little antsy. Let's see. Let's see the progression. One, two. So we're working the we're working the stick concept bottom of the screen. Spot stick not there. We start losing it inside. I mean, Fertney just can't hold that guy. Plays dead. Play action. Step up. A little flick. I mean, does he have to throw this on the run? Kind of. Not a bad throw. I like the climb route. I mean, it's interesting. We haven't really run the climb with the outside receiver with it with Anthony. So it's an interesting concept. But in order for that ball to be a little more accurate, it's got to try to, fight, try to set his feet. When you're climbing the pocket, that's really tough. If anything, he maybe should have just taken off here. Stepped up and just gotten two yards and went down. But second and ten. Three by one nub formation. Going to keep it. And here, here is them getting beat by him a couple times on the run, and now they're spying. So we got a scrape exchange defender back here. So the safety is coming downhill. Because since we have the nub formation, we're not worried about the vertical ball. And he's just going to come downhill. So when they squeeze, he's going to fill. And this is the difference between being a gunslinger and a make a play guy and an athletic quarterback because he just doesn't quite have the burst and now he gets corralled. All right, third and 10. And take our shots, protection just killed us. Story of the year. You know, Jake Renfro gets beat. Not much you could do there. That kills that drive. All right. You know what? I think we're going to call it there. So, to wrap up Tanner Mordecai. For me, he's going to go down as one of my favorite quarterbacks in Badger history. And it's one of those, it's just one of those what ifs type situations where if you wonder if one or two plays go the right way, how different this season's going to be. But when you look at Mordecai, the player, God, he was fun to watch. I think he introduced a lot of Badger fans to the idea of having an athletic quarterback who can make plays with his feet. I think... He 
introduced Badger fans to the idea of having a quarterback who could think on the move, think for himself, make decisions for himself, for better or for worse. Phil Longo gives his quarterbacks a lot of leeway. It has to be earned, which is why you saw him get a lot of playing time. But, you know, the air raid is not a cookie cutter. Everyone's going to be in the exact same spot every single time kind of offense. And it takes a certain kind of quarterback to understand that mentality and to be able to execute. And I think he did. He didn't execute as much as we had hoped. There was so much hype around him throughout this season. Probably because it comes down to we're used to the Alex Hornibrooks and the Joel Staves of the world. And when Jack Cohn is the second best quarterback your program has produced in the past 20 years, it really makes you think. And heck, he didn't really produce until he went to Notre Dame. Um, we expected too much. He gave 100% of what he could. And I think we expected too much because we didn't know what to expect. We just went by feelings. And we weren't ready for the tra- we weren't ready for the idea of a transition. And myself included. Because I thought he was the perfect mix of experience in the system and the type of player that we needed to help with that transition. I think he did a good job. He led the transition. Uh, I think he's going to go down as a great teammate, a great leader. And I think he's the type of guy who's going to catch on at the next level. At least get a training camp invite. Could potentially be a, a practice squad type guy. He's a poor man, poor man's Garner Minshew. And with the right system in the NFL, he could find a, find a home for a few years. And then I hope he gets into coaching because he's smart. He understands the offense. He understands modern quarterback play. And I think he's got a lot to give to the sport. So there he is, Tanner Mordecai. The man, the myth, the legend. And it was a lot of fun to watch this season. So, hope you enjoyed this breakdown. Again, thanks to Ryan from Locked On Badgers for coming on, talking to me a little bit about Tanner here at the beginning. Next video you're going to see from us, hopefully, is going to be Chapter 4 of our Introduction to the Dairy Raid Offensive System series. So, until then, thank you for watching. See you next time.